leave. Oké, okay, goedenavond iedereen. Uh, als het goed is uh, zijn we al live en ik kan iedereen mij nu horen. Uh, hopelijk ook zonder echo deze avond en hopelijk uh, werkt YouTube vanavond uh, goed mee. En ja, zal... zonder echo. Gaat helemaal Mooi. goed. Geen echo, fijn. Dat ook opgelost. Uh, vanavond hebben we Bob Vlad en Blob uh, spreekt Engels, dus wij gaan deze avond ook in het Engels voortzetten. En uh, I'll start talking English right now. So ja, uh, yeah, Bob Vlad, uh, he needs a little introduction for anyone who has uh, any interest in pelagics. He is of course uh, well known for the uh, series of identification guides he wrote, North Atlantic Seabirds. And uh, I would like to give the floor to him. So if you would like to start sharing your screen, Bob. Yep, okay. Nice. So, are we working okay there? Yes. Yeah, yeah this is all fine. Okay. Well, I'll start the talk first of all by uh, saying good evening from the Isles of Scilly. And it's a windy, blustery night here. And I hope to bring uh, a bit of city projects into your evening this evening. So as in the introduction, uh, we've been, you know, we've been working on a series of books, ID of North Atlantic seabirds, and we've produced four of them. And the most recent one is the Shearwaters Guide. Now it's a incredibly uh, interesting piece of work. There were many, many issues that we had to resolve when looking at the Shearwaters. Uh, I would say half a dozen quite tricky puzzles. And one of them, which I'm going to talk about this evening, is the case of short-tailed shearwater. When we first wor started work on the book, uh, really short-tailed shearwater was just a, a side uh, entrant to the book. There had only been two cases in the Atlantic at all. And we thought we'd just put it in uh, as a potential confusion for um, uh, sooty shearwater, but as you're going to see, as the uh, whole thing progressed, the puzzle started to broaden, deepen, and uh, it was really quite challenging and quite good, quite good fun as well. And through this, we gained what we think were quite a few uh, new insights, and I'm going to share some of those with you this evening. So, this talk is called "Figuring Out the Puzzle." of short-tailed shearwater in the North Atlantic. And we're going to look at two main things. First of all, uh, the range and vagrancy potential. And looking at this, we're going to discover that the vagrancy potential, or at least I'm going to argue that the vagrancy potential of short-tailed shearwater in the Atlantic, in the North Atlantic, is a lot higher than we ever thought. And therefore, it's quite pressing for us to, if we want to find one of these things, to uh, know about how to ID a vagrant in the North Atlantic. So those will be the two main topics, range in vagrancy potential and ID of a vagrant in the North Atlantic. So what is the confusion group that we have to worry about? Well, we've got short-tailed shearwater, obviously, and a brief description of that is it's an all-dark shearwater with pale or whitish in the underwings. And what might we confuse with that? Well, obviously uh, city shearwater. It's a notorious confusion uh, species throughout the uh, oceans. Uh, very often when you go to places like Australia where these things breed, uh, the locals are struggling with the odd uh, sooty and short-tailed. So it's actually quite a tricky uh, confusion pair. But in the Northeast Atlantic, we've also got dark Balearic shearwater. And it seemed to me that for the trained eye, dark Balearic shearwater might indeed be uh, more of a potential confusion species than sooty shearwater. Well, just to uh, get going, get us going and to see it's actually not quite so straightforward, uh, a few ID teasers. So I'll, I'll put up a picture there. Um, we know what the confusion uh, group is, so the choice is Sooty shearwater, short-tailed shearwater, or Balearic shearwater. Well, I'm sure you're looking at that thinking that's got a lot of whitish in the underwing. Uh, it surely must be uh, a sooty shearwater. 
that it's a short-tailed shearwater. And I can point you, and as we look at photos, actually, I will point out the ID features, although we'll look at this specifically later on in a talk. But have a look at this. I'll just get my pointer sorted out. Uh, so just have a look at uh, the front end of this bird. It's got a pretty short neck. It's got a, a sort of small squarish head, a very steep sloping forehead. And I think you might agree with me that Bill looks quite short relative to the size of the head. And those are pretty good indicators that this is a short tailed shearwater. What we're actually seeing here is uh, variation uh, an extreme variation at the very pale end of the uh, underwing coverts of short tailed shearwater. Uh, and it's suggesting the underwing is suggesting sooty or indeed balearic. So here's another one. Well, Bob's already tried to trick us uh, with a pale underwing on a short tailed shearwater. So what's this going to be? Another one of those? Or is it really a sooty? Or is it a balearic? I wonder what your thoughts are. Well, it's a balearic. And we can see that quite clearly. Its coloration actually isn't sooty colored, but you can see on this fairly dark bird, it's uh, got a nice pale belly. So that's reasonably straightforward, that one. And the last one, this is taken off the Netherlands, as you'll see in a minute, it's credited. So this is an all dark underwing. And we typically associate uh, the darker underwings with short tailed shearwater. But this, in fact, is a sooty shearwater. And if you're watching, Luke, thanks very much indeed for letting me use this uh, photo in the book and so on. But you can see it's a sooty. I mean, look at the length of that bill, long slender bill uh, there. It's got a long neck, beautiful sort of torpedo shaped body, just an absolute classic sooty, but it's showing extreme variation in having a completely dark underwing. Now that's quite rare, but it's uh, far from uh, unknown. Okay, those were a few teasers. So let's look at the vagrancy potential of short-tailed shearwater to the North Atlantic. So what about the range? Well, here's the map from the shearwater guide. And when we started preparing this map, it all seemed quite straightforward. The birds breed in this area of Australia, particularly around uh, Tasmania and, and so on. Uh, they arrive around about September, October, egg laying about November, chicks fledge around about April. And uh, what we learnt was that the birds tend to go down beyond the Antarctic front, feed up for a couple of weeks and then off they go because they're going to make this massive long migration without any stop across the uh, equator uh, right up here uh, to off Japan where some will stop off and feed and then up into the Bering Sea switching over to this side and they'll hang out there where the feeding generally is excellent uh, but you do have a few poor years and large die-offs but uh, they'll need to molt the uh, intending birds, uh, uh, the birds intending to breed will then set off and head on back to Australia uh, to get back here for around about sort of September, October time. It was also quite clear that some of the non-breeders, around about 15% of, of breeders have a sabbatical and obviously you've got the younger birds that are not breeding. They just have a more leisurely wander around here and this is where uh, the Californians and so on, they managed to get short tails on their trip and then they head on back. So that was what we knew 2015, 2016. And the only accepted records in the Atlantic were off Florida, USA, a moribund bird and uh, one bird found dead off Brazil. So it didn't look very promising for short tailed in the Atlantic Ocean. Until in 2017, uh, things changed in our thinking anyway, quite dramatically. Peter Ryan from the Fitzpatrick Institute of uh, Ornithology, Cape Town, sent me an email with an attachment 
or photographs around Bouvet Island, which is uh, high latitudes of the South Atlantic Ocean. And he said to me, please tell me I'm not going mad. These are thousands of short tailed shearwaters in the photograph, aren't they? And indeed they were. And he respect Peter respectively, uh, retrospectively uh, thought back on thousands he'd seen on a previous trip in that area in April 2008 and began to believe that those probably were short tails as well. Then we had some contacts in the North Indian Ocean, Southeast Asia area, who we've been asking about short tailed shearwater, and they said to us, we're seeing lots and lots of them in, this was May in uh, 2017. So April, there's a lot in the South Atlantic. May, there seems to be a lot going through uh, the Indian Ocean through Southeast Asia. But most amazingly, uh, I heard from uh, Steve Howell, who pointed out to me that he'd found a short-tailed shearwater at Race Point off Massachusetts, USA. That was massive news because he was uh, a live, healthy bird uh, off Race Point, And that made us think quite differently about the possibility of short-tailed in the Atlantic, especially the North Atlantic. Well, Steve, announced this, people who started looking through their photos of shearwaters off race point at that point in time. In fact, there were many, many, many thousands of uh, shearwaters off race point, and uh, this included uh, great shearwaters and sooty shearwaters, and it was spectacular because they were feeding actually in the surf and you could wade in up to your knee and be surrounded by great shearwaters. So a lot of people have gone there to photograph these birds, and after Steve made his announcement, people went back through their photos of city shearwaters, and uh, a short-tailed shearwater was found in some of the photos, and then subsequently uh, there were two more sightings. Well, based on primary molt timing and the fact there were many thousands of birds there, we think there were probably uh, four individuals, but there were certainly two, uh, but probably four individuals, which is exceptional, obviously. And we're also aware of a record of South Africa from mid-August. It's not 2017, but it's relevant mentioning that uh, at the moment. So here are some of these birds. This is the South African bird. If I can just point you to important features, they're going to be repeated again and again as this talk goes on. But here we've got a nice squarish head, a, a nice steep forehead. What to my eye anyway looks like a relatively short bill if you're thinking about sooty shearwater. But look very, very carefully and you can see that the nasal tubes come down to about here. And the maxillary unguis to about there. And so what we might call the colminicorn, or I like to call it the mid midsection gap there is very short. And that, uh, according to our research, research is diagnostic of short tailed. It's also actually got a nice pale throat, a nice pale chin and throat, which seems to be quite typical of short tailed shearwaters. This is one of the race point uh, birds. What gives this one away partly is the underwing. You see how darkish the uh, secondary coverts and primary coverts are. Very important is that they're not um, contrasting very strongly with the remages there, which is quite typical of short-tailed shearwater. Again, the neck's quite short, the bill looks quite short, the nasal tubes look quite long. It's difficult to see exactly what the gap is there, but again, it looks quite short to my eyes. Uh, a third bird, same sort of features, a nice actually compact body you can see there, a pale chin, shortish bill, steep forehead and look at the underwings again there, quite darkish, very little contrast between the remages and the primary coverts. And this is my favourite one from the Race Point Birds. It's an absolute classic, shortish bill, long nasal tubes, this short gap between the maxillary unguis and the nasal tubes uh, and look at that underwing, absolute classic short-tailed shearwater underwing. You can't argue with that. Now, these photos were taken over several months. You can see the molt here on this bird in the August bird has progressed to about P 
seven, whereas this particular bird, it's just about completing its molt. Well, let me say a bit more about range, because after that, we decided to dig a bit deeper. And we contacted our friends up in India and also Malaysia, Singapore, and indeed friends out in Hong Kong. And we found that there indeed was a pattern of movement in these months, April to June, of birds passing through this area. And as I've just said, in 2017, they had these uh, very large numbers relative to previous years. We also found by digging into the academic literature that there were some quite technical, I must say, uh, articles uh, using sort of data logger devices and so on. Um, we came across one which showed that they, a bird had been trapped to the South Indian Ocean. Uh, that was quite exciting to have absolute confirmation about that. But we've still got this gap here between that record from Australia and Peter's record of thousands around here. But amazingly, just before the Shearwaters Guide went to press, I was asked to review a paper for polar biology. And that paper just happened to be uh, about short-tailed shearwaters, uh, which had been data logged, and that they found that failed breeders moved en masse all the way across into the South Atlantic, tying up with uh, Peter's uh, sightings here. So the, that part of the jigsaw was complete, and we began to think that, well, if they're here, why uh, uh, would they want to go all the way back to Australia and head up this way? Maybe it's a slightly shorter route to cut across here, and then that would tie on, uh, tie up with the, the movement through uh, in North Indian Ocean and uh, Singapore Strait and so on. It's only a hypothesis, and we haven't proved it, but it still holds as a hypothesis. There is a record from South Africa, as you've seen, and we also know of one from the Mascarene Islands as well. So uh, that's indeed possible. So that made us think a bit further. What is the vagrancy potential to the Northeast Atlantic? Well, we wrote a re uh, an article for British Birds, which they very kindly published for us in 2019. And the article asked, why are there no records? in the Northeast Atlantic? Have they been overlooked? Just asking the question. And we, through the article, tried to raise awareness uh, that the vagrancy potential could be higher than we thought. And uh, here are some, in the article we said, here are some ID criteria uh, to use to uh, help people to look for them. So we could find out, in fact, whether we were missing them or whether it was just a nice idea that they might be coming over to our side of the Atlantic. And that uh, criteria involved both established and some new criteria, uh, which we found very important. And then in 2020, bang, three confirmed records. Now, it's still too early for us to say anything from that, uh, but I find it uh, quite coincidental that we it would be uh, strange if it hadn't been perhaps greater awareness through that British Birds article that had led people to look a little bit more carefully. And in fact, this is the story of how it unfolded. The first bird actually to be identified in the Northeast Atlantic was County Waterford, Ireland. And that was found in June 2020. And I'm not going to say too much about it because there's a Dutch birding article coming out and I don't want to spoil it all. But there's a bit of a story behind it, I must say. And I was sat down one evening and my wife, every, about once a month, makes me a super duper dinner. And this evening, the dinner finished with a fruit crumble and custard, which if you know Englishmen, you'll know that that's about as close to Nirvana as you can get. So I was really looking forward to this uh, dinner. And I literally sat down for the dinner and the first course was served up and I saw a push notice coming up on my iPhone that I'd received an email. And as you do, you just got to casually look at it. And I saw that the email was from Killian Milani. Well, 
I don't get very many emails from Killian Milani, so this interested me. It's a bit like getting uh, a message from, from for a birder from, from God. So I wondered what on earth Killian would be wanting of me. So I opened his email and he said, he told me a little bit about this sheer water and he said he's had a look at it and he's used our criteria, what we call new criteria, to identify this as a short-tailed shearwater. And this happened to be the uh, ratio of build proportions. Well, if you put something out in the uh, journals and you're claiming something new, you better make sure you're right. And I knew at some point in time that we would ha be called to question or uh, we would have to actually uh, argue that uh, this was indeed uh, an important uh, criteria, the proportions of the bill. But I, I really didn't think it would be Killian. And I thought, oh my God, what have we screwed up? And my whole sense of feeling changed immediately. I went off my dinner completely and I had to go away and look at all these photos. Uh, the story actually is uh, got a happy ending. Uh, because we were aware they had the skin and this eventually would be DNA'd. But uh, over the process, process, the next few days, we more or less proved it with uh, uh, biometrics. And then Paul Archer uh, organised the DNA of it uh, and so on. So uh, the process of getting there with this short-tailed shear water article had its few uh, stomach-wrenching moments. So this became quite uh, widely known about through social media and some French guys uh, who I think seen the Bridget Bird article and they saw uh, Paul's, uh, Paul Archer's photos of this bird and so on thought that remind, this is now going on to August, uh, that this all reminds them uh, very much of a bird that they were, were seeing out in, in Brittany. And they sent through the photos and uh, we believed it was a short-tailed shearwater. And on the basis of that, they looked back at uh, some previous photos and came up with another photo of a classic short-tailed shearwater. So three birds uh, in uh, by the end of uh, 2020 in the Northeast Atlantic. That's a result. I'm a little bit miffed, I must say, that we didn't get the first one of uh, silly projects, but we are looking hard and we are still hopeful. Just after that, and still on this business about range and vagrancy potential, I received this photograph and I was asked what it was. And well, apart from saying it's a dead bird, which is fairly obvious, I said, well, it, it looks very much like it's uh, either a short-tailed shearwater or, or a sooty shearwater, but there's nothing I can really do from that photo. Not really. I've got my suspicions. And I asked, you know, are there any more photos? Well, the uh, Canadians in the Arctic got a really nice uh, citizen science project going on. In fact, it was uh, some non-birders who found this, but through the citizen science project, uh, they picked it up as they'd been asked to, uh, collect any sort of dead animals and so on. And they'd been asked if they found something like this to detail it as much as possible, as well as possible. And they had the foresight to put a ruler against uh, the bill. So I then received this photo and immediately uh, believed it was a short-tailed shearwater. And I'll tell you why, because if you just look at the nasal tubes there, uh, you could draw a line about there, and then the maxillary unguis, you draw a line about there at the end of that. And that gap here, as you're going to see as this talk progresses, is relatively short, well outside the range of sooty shearwater. Uh, we argue it's diagnostic, absolutely diagnostic. But we could also take the measurement here of 3.1 uh, uh, centimetres uh, and... Uh, that actually ties up with short-tailed shearwater as well. So this raised quite an interesting question. Uh, we thought possibly short-tailed shearwater was heading to us through the uh, perhaps South Atlantic, but what about the possibility of uh, short-tailed shearwater coming through the Northwest Passage? 
I'm sure you're all aware that Northwest Passage with glo global warming and so on is um, with a lot more melt and some years you can actually sail through sort of around about August time. I've had friends do it in fact. But we decided to first of all look at where this bird was found which is D there. I don't really know how to pronounce it because I've never heard anyone from the region but the uh, region is uh, spelled N-U-N-A-V-U-T, so Nunavut, I'm calling it, I might be wrong, but that's where the bird was, was found. And we contacted some Canadian ornithologists from this region and asked them if they could help us collect data. And we found that short-tailed shearwaters have been found elsewhere. Now let's go back to uh, September. The short-tailed shearwaters we know come into the Bering Sea, millions of them there. And we also know from expedition cruisers, amongst other things, who just nose out into the Chukchai Sea that hundreds of thousands get uh, to here. But what we subsequently found is uh, that they, in smaller numbers, seem to move right down into the Canadian Arctic, Ele Arctic Archipelago region. So A, uh, so at Yukon, there were two there in August 2007 more or less tying up with the September in this area. Uh, B, there was one there in the Northwest Territories in October 1990. That's quite late, certainly wouldn't have been intending on breeding. Uh, then in the Amundsen Gulf region, uh, there were small numbers reported in several autumns. C is a, a dead bird. Uh, in February 1994 it was found, but uh, the people who found it, they inspected and thought it was probably had died there the previous evening the bird that we've just looked at, and then a bird down here in Hudson Bay, Ontario area, which was identified as a sooty and a short tail. So there's evidence, in fact, that birds could be coming through this area. So we looked at the, uh, sorry, the ice shrink of the Arctic, and there's some great stuff published on it. And here we go, if we go back a few decades, this would be uh, a typical sort of summer, uh, the region which was covered in, in ice, so everything inside that. And I believe what we see in white here is the amount of ice that there was in 2019. And so you can see the amount of shrinkage. But what's quite interesting uh, in this is that the Amundsen Channel and through here are all melting. And this is, remember, where we saw some of the, the records of birds here and here and here uh, and so on. And so we believe there's a, a real possibility, if not a probability, that birds could be getting through that way as well. So there's two routes to the Northeast Atlantic and they're not exclusive at all. Uh, they could be coming through one, other or both. Well, if we get one in the Northeast Atlantic, or let's put it this way, if you get one in the Northeast Atlantic, uh, how are you going to know it's uh, a short-tailed shearwater. Well, we're just going to expand on some of the things that I've already mentioned. So we have the separation criteria, flight behaviour and general appearance. I like to use video for that. Uh, plumage aspect, I'm going to use John Gale's illustrations from the shearwaters guide for that. Uh, structure, again, I'm going to use John's uh, illustrations and we'll use some photos. So sooty shearwater, let's just take a look at some video. This, by the way, was not filmed for David Attenborough's shows. Uh, this is purely to help us think about ID. So uh, let's see what we can find. This is a sooty shearwater. Look at that, very long, narrow wings. It's a strong, energetic and fast flyer. Here it's flying low to the surface because of the light wind. If you look at its wing beats, it's got bursts of stiff, fast, deepish wing beats and frequent glides. In slightly moderate winds, it makes shallow arcs. And when it does that, it reveals this typical classic white underwing flash. Well, these birds are filmed as we left Falklands. And it was quite sunny and the sun was behind me. So uh, it was really quite neat. It's exaggerating the white in the underwing, obviously. In strong wind, well, to my mind, these are the masters of long, high wheeling arcs, and they can cover huge amounts of ground in very quick time. 
ideal for a long distance migrant, obviously. Uh, so um, that's important. And then a closer view here, if you just check a look at the wings there, you see how they curl up a little bit at the tips. That's because the wings are very, very long. And there is a rule of thumb, you can just about see it in these photos, that the uh, primary coverts on the underwing on sooty typically are paler than the secondary coverts. There's a few albatrosses photobombing us here. The salvins there shoots through. Let's have a look at uh, Balearic again. We're not trying to uh, be David Attenborough here. Uh, sorry, it's just flipped on to the wrong one. We just flipped back. Here we go. So here's a Balearic. Uh, the flight, to my mind, compared to the city, looks very effortful. I like this term. It's not a flying virtuoso. As long bursts, long bursts of fastest shallow wing beats and generally short glides. And it flies almost always quite close to the surface in a fairly direct line. And here we've got some Manx shearwaters coming in, really showing it up. Look how dynamic and effortless the Manx shearwaters flight is. And this poor old Balearic shearwaters hammering away uh, whilst these Manx are almost like uh, showing off to it at how brilliantly they can fly. Manx to being long distant migrants. Here we can see a group of Balearic shearwaters and you'll see from here when they tilting rather than arcing that even the darkest birds here uh, show a pale central underbelly. Here we've got, uh, we're in the Mediterranean now so the light's quite harsh but look for that combination of pale underwing coverts and central underbelly. And also look how effortful the flight is, although admittedly there's no wind there to, to help the birds. And in this clip, we're going to be photobombed by Manx and Sooty again. But you, here you see the bird hammering along and then a few Manx just whiz past effortlessly. And there's a Sooty there, if you look, you can see uh, how much darker that Sooty is. Actually, let's just have a look again at that last bit. You just... Look how blackish the sooty looks compared to the Balearic shearwater there as it comes down. So the question is, if I saw a short-tailed shearwater based on what we've just seen there, what might catch my eye? Well, here's a short-tailed in the Bering Sea, and you'll see it's got a far more dynamic flight than a Balearic shearwater. It's flying a bit more like the Manxes there. So you wouldn't really see a Balearic shearwater fly like that. It's really quite a compact bird. And I want you to start looking here for uh, the head, neck and bill. And you see how short that actually looks uh, on, on the bird. And again here, look at the head, neck and the bill. Always looks weirdly short to my mind, as if it's sort of like uh, cut off. And the, the flight it's got, it's actually quite dashing flight compared to uh, sooty shearwater, the shallow wing beats. And here, uh, look for the short neck, squarish head and short bell, uh, short bill. So that short neck, squarish head and short bill. And when the bird's moving rapidly like that, it's much more difficult to pin it down exactly. Uh, but you get the impression of it uh, as the bird flies through. So if you saw a short tail fly by, there might be some clues before you take photographs of it uh, and the like. Let's just take a look at these birds on the water. Uh, these are sooty shearwaters again. Uh, so look for here the long bill, uh, relatively long bill and a sloping forehead almost always. And I think that long uh, city shearwaters seem to have very long body bodies. Uh, and the, you can see the primaries projecting a little bit there beyond the tail end. There's a bit of a primary projection. And notice that it's the dark breast. That's going to be an important point as we go on. It's got a completely dark breast. And here's a bird that decided to join us on a city pelagix. So again, look at the long bill, uh, the short nasal uh, uh, tubes relative to 
In fact, we'll wind that back a bit there if I can get one. There, so it's got a longish bill, sh relatively short nasal tubes compared to uh, the short tails that we've been looking at. And here is the maxillary unguis. And just look how long that stretch is there. Thinking about that compared to the short tails that we've been looking at earlier. This was safely released and uh, flew away quite happily. Balearic shearwaters. Here's one. Notice this is actually quite a dark bird. Notice it's got that pale breast above the waterline there. It's actually about Manxy size. And watch what happens when it takes off. Where's that pale breast gone? It actually seems to darken up on the breast. There's a sooty here uh, near to this bird. I hope you took your seasick tablets before this talk, by the way. Uh, but there's a, a sooty there, so you can see how sooty coloured it is relative to this greyish brown um, balearic. Now watch what happens. Here's the same balearic again, and it merges. It's almost like it morphs into something completely different as it comes out of the, the wave. So I'll control this manually here. Uh, so it's got that lovely white front. And this is something that we've noticed really quite uh, recently uh, with Balearic shearwaters. They're not that common off silly. And we're pleased if we get one sat on the ground, but it's got that white front. And then when it takes off, bang, it just seems to disappear completely. So if you're looking at a bird sat on the water with that whitish upper breast area and you're wondering, could this be a short tail? The chances are it's uh, going to be a Balearic. Now look at this bird. It's got a long bill, long drawn out bill, sloping forehead, compact body. And the primary projection projections relatively short there. It looks a bit like a duck in a way. If that were a sooty or a short tailed, it would have a pointy end with the primary projection coming beyond the tail end. This is a lovely little bird. This was in um, standard definition era. But again, look at long, how long that bill is. You can see the pale front again uh, there. And uh, compact body, mid grayish brown. There's also a fun clip because we enjoyed watching this bird. Uh, messing around with the Argentius uh, herring gulls. They were fighting over the food and this little fellow would come through and grab it from them, leaving them totally confused. And that stayed with us for about an hour, that bird. It was lovely. Well, again, what might catch your eye if you saw a short-tailed? Now, these birds are filmed in the Bering Sea and look at it. To my eyes, that looks quite a dinky bird. It looks quite compact. You can see that squarish type hat head again. Look for the relatively short bill. It's a nice size comparison there with Pacific fulmers. And you can see the uh, primary projection. The uh, wings are pointing out at the end there, uh, which you wouldn't see on a Balearic. There's another Pacific fulmer giving you size comparison for the size of these things. It's got a dark breast also, look at that, that dark breast. Well, I think video is really helpful in getting us to see the general, well, people call it jizz, don't they? The jizz of these creatures, uh, but actually becoming quite familiar with the flight and flight style. If you watch, for example, the clips that we just looked at over and over again, you begin to see these differences and in the end, they start shouting at you. Uh, I, this is why I think some seabirders fight, find it very frustrating with rare bird committees in that you can, can become so familiar with some of these things on uh, what might be considered quite cryptic species. And understandably, the rare bird committees find it difficult to accept that you could have seen some of, of the features you're describing. Well, we're now going to turn our attention to plumage aspect. And we're concerned with overall color, uh, the underwing pattern from uh, looking at the underwing coverts and the remages. And we'll look at the chin and throat uh, issue as well. And I'm going to use John Gale's beautiful illustrations from the Shearwater Guide. So color, well, basically we've got a sort of grayish brown, you might uh, say, for this Balearic Shearwater. 
and that contrasts with what is a fresh plumaged short-tailed shearwater, uh, so it's like sooty brown, and a fresh plumaged short-tailed shearwater, uh, I hope I said that, which is sooty brown, and uh, this is a sooty shearwater, and that would be the same colour as we see here in fresh plumage, but here we got a stump, slightly bleached bird, you can see some malt contrast uh, there as well. Now, the colour, I mean, OK, we can see it there, but it is actually quite tricky in the field, especially under different light conditions, but it's worth noting. Looking at the underwing, these are more or less typical underwings, the most likely underwings that you're going to see. So, Bally Arik, I just changed my... Uh, so Balearic has got a nice big splash, and actually this tends not to vary an awful lot. It's more or less like that, but it contrasts more on the dark birds because it's contrasting with these dark flanks and so on. But here's a pretty typical short-tailed shearwater uh, where the underwings really uh, are quite sort of diffuse. Uh, there's no strong contrast, very, very important. Uh, is the uh, lack of strong contrast between the under primary coverts and the under primaries there. There's a, this rule of thumb which I mentioned earlier, this is a sooty where for the sooty, the primary coverts tend to be paler than the secondary coverts. It's reversed, uh, uh, there's a rule of thumb that's reversed with short-tailed shearwater and it's not overly emphasised here, but if you just squint your eyes, blur your eyes, you can see that John actually has made this area slightly paler than here, and it can be quite uh, striking in the field. Chin, most sooties just seem to have a dark chin. You can have some with pale. Uh, you would expect a short tail to have a pale chin, maybe even extending down into the throat. And this is also true of dark balearyx. Turning our attention to structure, we want to be looking for the front end projection, which I really mean neck, head and bill. The bill itself, uh, the wings and the body shape. So here's John's um, images again. And we can see uh, here that uh, the sooty shearwater is really quite long winged. I mean, the angle of it is such that it's not doesn't look quite as long winged as in the uh, video, uh, but it's pretty long winged. Short tails, long winged, uh, but also very narrow. As you see, this is quite narrow, and uh, the wings, relatively speaking, of Balearica are not so long. And actually, this accounts for the flight behaviour that we saw, because Balearics they're just a dispersive species, really. They're just going to move out of the Mediterranean up to Brittany and possibly off southwest England. Whereas these boys, they need wings uh, to get them all the way uh, up across the equator to the North Pacific Bering Sea and all the way back again. So these creatures uh, are structured quite differently to make them be able to do that. And hence the Balearic flight style is rather unimpressive, flies low to the water and doesn't glide an awful lot, doesn't really arc like uh, the short-tailed and, and the uh, sooty. A really important feature that we've uh, already looked at earlier is this short build look of short-tailed shearwater and a sort of squarish head look, uh, which you can see there, and relatively short neck. And compare that to the sooty here, which I think this is a beautiful image, by the way, of City, one of the most beautiful images John's painted. But you can see here, uh, it's got a relatively long neck and this sort of longish bill. So just study this area and you get a totally different feel about the bird than if you sort of study this area. And you do see that in the field quite clearly when you're familiar with it. Balearic, uh, well, uh, this has really relatively speaking, the longest bill of the three, relatively speaking. It's got a very long bill and sort of quite a longish neck. And it's got the unique uh, broad hips, which you don't see uh, with short-tailed and sooty. 
And perhaps another point I could mention here is the more compact look of short-tailed in terms of its body looks more compact than uh, sooty. So on the water, we can look a little bit more closely now at some of those points. So here's the Balearic. It's got what I call the pulled out face look uh, with a long bill. And if you were close to uh, this sat on, for example, if you found this, uh, if you were looking uh, in, in flocks of Balearic shearwaters for short tailed, which you might do, because this is where the French found their short tails amongst Balearics, then you're going to consistently see this very sort of long bill and this sort of drawn out face. And then if you suddenly came across a short tailed, it should jump at you. Uh, well, hit cold, maybe you would think, oh, that looks quite interesting. Uh, but look at the forehead shape there, it's quite steep, the relatively short bill. Sooty again has got quite a drawn out face and a long bill. So unique amongst these three is this sort of head and bill shape of Balearic, of uh, short tailed. But look at short tailed here and look at just how long those nasal tubes are and how where the maxillary unguis comes in here. So you could draw a line there and a line about there, giving you a very short midsection gap or colminicorn. But on sooty, if you drew a line there and the end of the maxillary ungui is there, say, that's relatively much, much longer. We'll come on to that point in a minute. Uh, we see with Balearic that um, it's actually intermediate. And being a puff in a shearwater rather than a den of shearwater, the bill structure is a bit different. So they tend to have a sort of more sloping uh, entrance to the nostrils there as well. But anyway. So this midsection gap, this is something which we think is really important come out of our studies anyway. Um, we were aware from BWPI, Birds of Western Palearctic, that short-tailed nasal tubes were quite long. But in the field, what we found most striking was uh, this short gap. It's something you, you know, we're looking for field marks, if you like. And uh, we thought that we would it, visually, this looked quite important. So we uh, went to museums. I went to Tring and measured their 30 odd birds they got there and worked out the proportions A, B and C of the total length D for the three species. And an average was 28% for short tailed. An average for sooty was 34.5% and Balearic was in between. Now, you might think 6% doesn't look much, but it actually does. You've already seen it uh, in the previous images. It's really significant. So if you think you're looking at a shortish bill with a short mid section gap, then start looking harder. Here's a photo of a sooty as an example. Now, this has got, got quite long nasal tubes actually, but nevertheless, that distance to the maxillary unguis there is really quite long. And uh, compare that, for example, to the short-tailed shearwater here, where that there's a bit of foreshortening due to the uh, head being slightly turned, but even so, you can see how relatively short that is and how long the nasal tubes are. I really do think this is extremely important uh, that if you're trying to document a bird, you believe you might have a short tail to your water. It's really, really important that you try and get a side on uh, shot of the head, a head in profile, head and bill in profile. If it's in flight or if it's swimming or whatever, because I believe that's the only truly diagnostic field mark that we have. And if you've got a dead bird where you can measure it. So here we've got a classic sooty and showing all the things we long, long narrow wings. Uh, we've got the long neck, longish bill, blah, blah, blah. If you look at the underwings, uh, strong contrast in the outer underwing. There's a short tail. The upper wing is the one to look at here. Uh, this one's uh, partially lit by sunlight, but you see here how the secondary coverts or the inner wing 
panel is paler than the outer wing and very little contrast. And it's an absolute classic, little short neck, compact body, short bill. If you look really hard, you can see the nasal tubes are quite long. And there's the Balearic, which uh, is showing this pale belly. Um, once the bird's in flight, then that should give it away. Even the darkest Balearics that I've seen anyway, and I've asked some of my Spanish friends, but they say even the darkest Balearic shows some pale in the central belly there. But sat on the sea, of course, the Balearic's belly is covered, so we lose that ID feature and we have to concentrate on other things. OK, so getting towards the end of the talk now, here's three birds. Are they short-tailed or are they sooty? We're putting uh, Balearic out of the equation now because I think most of us would quickly get to the conclusion that we were looking at either a short-tailed or a sooty. What do you think about that one? Well, it's got longish body, sort of a bit sooty-like, isn't it? And uh, yeah, OK, so the wingtips going beyond the tail end reasonably, although they're quite worn. Uh, but look at the head. It's got quite a sloping forehead, shortish bill. I don't know. Maybe we go for short tailed on that, perhaps. What about this one? It looks very, very similar. Indeed, it's a sort of quite a compact little bird. It's got the whitish chin and sort of a squarish type head. Uh, I don't know, it could be short tailed again. This bird's certainly got a long body. Doesn't have the primary projection because that's so worn there. But when you look at the head, that starts thinking, well, maybe short tailed. Got a steep forehead there, longest nasal tubes. I don't know, let's have a look. Here's one of the birds. Well, I wonder what you've concluded. Well, I've nicked Killian Milani's analysis of this without asking. Well, I did ask him, actually. I sent him an email about an hour ago, uh, which because uh, I forgot to ask him. But uh, this is one of the French birds which was sent to us as a putative short tailed shearwater. And uh, Killian did this analysis of the bill. It's uh, he's used slightly different. He's got A, B, C and D there, but the mid central uh, gap there is C and that works out to 25% and that's absolutely diagnostic of short tailed shearwater and then if you look at the bird again you look at the head shape and so on you know you're sort of in with that one I'm 100% happy that's a short tailed shearwater okay what about this guy well as we've said it certainly looks dinky and it's got that lovely whitish chin. But well, when you look at it, it was sent to me actually as a possible short tailed. But when you look at it, it doesn't look quite right. Let's have a look at the head in a bit more detail. The forehead is sloping and it's got long, uh, shortish nasal tubes, a long midsection gap. There's the kink at the maxillary unguis. Look at that. That's more than 25% the length of the bill. It really is off-putting having this pale chin because that's so much, that's so typical of, uh, of short tail. But anyway, let's flush it and have a look. Oh, look at that white underwing. Classic city when it takes off. But on the water, I think you'd agree with me. It's a tricky bird. Definitely a tricky bird. What about this guy? Well, we've been through things before. There's certainly strong suggestions this could be a short tailed in the head shape, looking at the shorter bill, nasal tubes. Let's blow up the head. Look at this very short mid central gap there. And we flush it and bang. There we've got the short tailed shear water underwing. So this is the other French bird from 2015. An absolute classic short tailed shear water. So with the County Wexford bird, which would be DNA'd uh, as uh, a short-tailed shearwater, 
And those two birds, I'm confident that there were three birds in 2020 at least, and there may be some more photos to come. So a summary from what I've said is that we strongly believe the vagrancy potential of short-tailed shearwater to the Northeast Atlantic, in fact, to the Atlantic per se, is much greater than previously thought. As I said, in early in 2017, they were just a moribund bird and a dead bird. And now look uh, at uh, what happens when knowledgeable people like Steve Howell looks at them and when we uh, have ID criteria set out for people to use to look at in the Northeast Atlantic, possibly seven birds there. Uh, short tailed flight is fast compared to sooty, like very snappy wing beats. It's quite maneuverable. It's got the attributes of a smaller bird, all around quicker actions. And generally speaking, I would say it's got more dashing flight. Balearic, this has uh, um, versus Balearic. Uh, the short-tailed shearwater has attributes of a long-distant migrant, so it's far more aerodynamic. Just think about when we saw those balearic, that balearic flying with the manxes. Uh, well, the short tail could replace the manxes in there, and you'd see the flight differences to be similar. With uh, short-tailed, you've got a short head and neck, short bill, short midsection gap, and narrow wings. Uh, with the plumage, uh, we know uh, from what we've seen that uh, dark, dark type Balearic and Sooty, uh, well, uh, short tail compared to them typically has this subdued pale underwing panel. And uh, also we have Sooty brown overall coloration rather than the dark greyish brown that more typifies Balearic and uh, sooty, and short tailed and Sooty for that matter lack this pale belly patch and indeed and sat on the water like that pale uh, breast above the waterline. But there are some quite tricky sooties as we've seen. Um, the one bird that we saw is an example of quite a few photos I've been sent of sooties. So frankly in the Northeast Atlantic I, I believe for bird to be accepted at the moment anyway we need this, uh, these diagnostic build proportions to be sure because as we've seen, sooties can have all dark underwings, uh, for example. So that's the way of nailing it. Well, I was uh, permitted to have a little sales spiel at the end. So if I may, just uh, very briefly, I'm sure some of you have seen or owned these books. Now, this has taken us the uh, best part of 15 years. We started off with the old Storm Petrels book and as a revised version of it. I couldn't resist then doing pterodromas, being such a beautiful bird. Then the very technical work required for aging uh, albatrosses and so on, finishing with the Shearwaters Guide. The Shearwaters Guide I think is still available. We've sold out here, but I think you can still buy it in the Netherlands. And I also uh, want to give a little bit of spiel uh, about silly pelagics, if I may, very, very briefly. Now, I just want to show you some testaments from our clients. This is tongue in cheek, of course. This is a photo of a typical day out off Scilly. And the testament is, it was a wonderful day out with Scilly Pelagics on a flat car motion in the dry, surrounded by seabirds. And believe it or not, under this pink coat, there's a young lady who appeared for about four or five minutes to see a Wilson's and then went back under uh, again. She had a great time. She actually said it was one of the most fantastic things she'd done in her life, which uh, was quite amazing. So you saw about four or five minutes of it. It was such a great experience that we gladly contributed to the chum. They provided everything that we needed, a sick bucket. The Wilson storm petals were unbelievably close. Or is she being sick? I was absolutely ecstatic when we got back to the quay. OK, just tongue in cheek. Great seabirding to you all. Thanks for listening. And uh, I'll try and revert back to Microsoft team and see if we can get back in touch with you guys. For all of us, we're a
testing one, two, three. And he... You did a perfect job, and then we screwed up. <laughs> yeah, I think we're back now, so we, they should be hear hearing us again without the echo. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I, if I speak for all of them, I think it was very, very nice presentation, very, uh, very clear, and uh, I think we uh, we can do some questions right now. There were a couple in the chat already, so um, the first question is uh, about the chances of uh, short-tailed shearwater being uh, in the in Dutch waters. What do you think about that? Well, when we looked at the Northwest Passage, we simply looked at the route from the Bering Sea uh, going eastward uh, through the uh, Canadian Arctic. There's absolutely no reason why the birds shouldn't go left, uh, hang a left and swing around over the north of Russia there. Um, nobody knows what's going to happen actually uh, in the future. Uh, I guess some of you will know that uh, there's predictions by 2050 August, September time, there'll be no ice whatsoever in the Arctic region, the North Pole region. Some people say by 2035. So, you know, the route's there uh, for sure. And the likelihood of birds coming through that route, going left or right, I would have thought is about equal. But it's all very speculative. The birds coming up from the south, I think these shoe waters are likely to, as they have actually, find other large groups of shearwaters probably because there's lots of food there anyway and they're going to start hanging around with them so the two french birds were in with balearic shearwaters the uh, race point birds were in with grapes and sooty so maybe uh, they are just like sooty is not so likely to head on up your way but i think it should be on the radar and i know a lot of dutch people uh, enjoy pelagics all over the place. Many of the pelagics I go on, in fact, just about all the pelagics I go on, uh, there's probably more Dutch people than there are other other nations. And, you know, we need to look out for these birds, not just, it would be great, by the way, to get a national first, obviously, for the Netherlands, but, you know, if you're on a pelagic uh, off Madeira, if you're on the Atlantic Odyssey coming up uh, through Cape Verde, uh, some of your fellow countrymen are coming to silly projects next year, you know, uh, you, you need to look out for them there as well. Okay, yeah, thanks for the answer. Uh, there's a, a question about the uh, difference in bill shape between adults and juvenile birds. Is there a difference between those? Yeah, bills? for sure. And there's also a sexual dimorphism. So the sooty that we looked at uh, toward the end, which I call a scary sooty, it's quite likely, actually, that that was a female and who knows, uh, a young bird. And so uh, they're going to have a more lightly structured uh, overall, including their bill, possibly shorter bills, especially juveniles if the bill's not uh, fully grown. So it is tricky, but the all of the measurements that we made for the mid-central gap uh, were consistent, whether it was a smaller or a, a longer bill. I, I just say one other point on this. All short-tailed shearwaters that we measured, we were able to make measurements, in fact, of the bill and the proportions. But some of the sooties, the maxillary unguis on the end was really quite flat. And finding a kink where it joined the common was, was quite difficult. Um, so you may feel a bit frustrated sort of not being able to clearly see the uh, central gap, but by definition, I would say that actually excludes short-tailed shearwater from our experience, uh, because that just doesn't seem to happen. They always seem to have this kink at the end of the maxillary unguis, giving us a, a point to measure there, and obviously where the nasal tubes meet the colman or colmanicorn, so you can get that, that measurement there. Um, there is a special request for you as well, uh, since uh, I'll just read it out. With your increased knowledge of Swinhus, Storm Petrel and Bulwers in the Atlantic in recent years, could you have another look at the 1995 Bulwers Petrel at the Dutch coast and clinch the ID? Cheers. It's from uh, Arjan Brenkman. He asks <laughs> it. Okay, next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't mind looking at it. I did actually look at it previously. And I just feel... I really, as a birder, feel so much for those observers. 
because the, the photos, as I seem to remember them, just weren't quite there. And there was some contradiction between what the tail looked like on one and the tail looked like on another. I'd always look again, uh, but maybe, okay. guys, you're just going to have to let that one go. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that. Um, Did the number of people signed in drop off then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. By the number of observers of the bird. Yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll be able to petition your uh, help uh, if they find uh, another picture of it, which clearly shows yeah. your ID. But I don't think there will be uh, any further development then. Um, mm. There's uh, no further questions so far. I, I got another question uh, via WhatsApp, WhatsApp. How can we get more out of North Sea Pelagics, would you think? How could we? See more uh, on North Sea Pelagics. See more because what? Birds, because we don't see on your any sea waters. Yeah, uh, off Netherlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tips. Okay. Well, I don't know how you guys go about it. Actually, uh, do you do chumming and stuff like that? Yes, yeah, some. But then... do you go? How far out do you go? You know, Dieters? No, I, I, I never no. been on Dutch Pelagic before. <laughs> I mean, the reality is, of course. Well, one time. But... You know that the the passage on the west side of North Sea is obviously much heavier uh, than around uh, your region, and birds just tuck around southeast England uh, and then maybe head across the English Channel. Am I allowed to call it that? Um, so, of course, the the number of birds passing through there are, are much less, but you can maximise your chances of pulling birds in. So one possibility, obviously, is to stop and charm, and that's actually quite good for storm petrels. But another possibility, we do this a lot in the Pacific and places like that, is we tow something called uh, a teaser. And so it'll be on about 30 foot of line, and it can't, it's actually something you can buy from a fishing shop. And it looks like a bit of a squid, and so you're towing it, and it's so designed that it flaps up and down yeah. a lot. And so, like, uh, we were using that recently on a trip when we sailed down to the Austral Islands. And it was absolutely brilliant uh, for bringing in Murphy's petrels and black petrel, grey petrel, uh, Juan Fernandez petrels, all different birds. They saw this splashing and they thought, we're just going to have a, a look. So maybe something like that. And there's always, always a better chance of drawing birds in if you've got birds behind you so I, I, I have no idea what you guys do but we make a big effort as we sail out of Scilly to uh, make sure gulls follow us and we chuck loads of stuff out uh, so we may get 40 or 50 gulls following us and then they'll follow us out we normally go about six miles something like that and then we've got them with us and the trick then is to try and keep them active so by feeding them it's more difficult when it's flat calm, um, but when it's windy, you can have the birds up in the air all the time. And it, it definitely uh, increases the number of birds that will uh, come in. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard about the Zeno's petrol from last year. Not that it's been accepted by BBRC yet. I'm not being too presumptive, but we were steaming back in uh, on one of our projects and we were surrounded by birds at the back of the boat, mainly gulls. Um, because we were towing chum at the time uh, that we'd been using uh, during a pelagic. And so we had this, this fantastic following and there's absolutely no doubt that that Zeno's petrol came in to have a look at what was going on uh, and had a look around for about 40 seconds. We didn't sound very long, but it's actually quite a long time and decided there was nothing there for a pterodroma and got back on with the normal business of being a Zeno's petrol. Cool. Yeah. People are texting me. We are going uh, to 40 to uh, 50 k's out, and uh, they're chumming a lot. So, uh, a lot okay. of girls, but uh, just no shearwaters or uh, pterodromas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we know the pterodromas are getting into the North Sea because they're being seen off uh, Yorkshire and places like that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, if, if I mean, we've got if, one record in the 90s. Oh, you did? Okay, that's yeah. interesting. I don't remember that. But I mean, certainly if, if they're not. Um, trying to take birds out with them. I mean, I don't know how many gulls you'd have around the ports you're leaving, but gulls are so greedy that uh, 
you know, they'll follow you for if you give them something decent to eat. So definitely try, if they're not doing it, try and take the gulls out with you. It's, uh, it's really important, actually. It makes a big difference for skewers and all sorts of things, Sabine's gulls. And when we're sort of, sometimes for some reason, the gulls can be fickle, especially after the breeding season. Uh, they get a bit more fussy and occasionally we go out and we just can't get any gulls out with us. And there's a very notable difference in the number of birds that we, we get to see. Okay. Cool. Uh, do you one have more? more oh, yeah. There's one more question in the chat. Is there a research with GPS senders on the short tails? That you know about? On the short tails, absolutely. Uh, the Australians have done some very, very interesting, uh, well, data loggers, if we're talking about that. Uh, I don't, so I'm, I don't know about any satellite, but data loggers, there's a lot more work coming out. Originally, it was actually just uh, for conservation reasons, obviously, uh, trying to find out where these uh, birds were feeding so that it could conserve uh, the areas in which they prefer to feed. And so they found that the birds were feeding, they had a sort of uh, two-part strategy. They'd either feel very, feed very close to the colony uh, and then maybe the next trip they go right down south of the Antarctic polar front. And they were doing the two things. But then this led them to find that uh, the occasional bird wandered quite far into the South Indian Ocean. And I believe that may have been the reason why uh, there was a sort of uh, a big effort to put data loggers on the birds. And that when they discovered that the failed breeders, the failed breeders uh, were going all the way to the South Atlantic, which is actually isn't a huge distance. Uh, at those very high latitudes, you know, the map makes it distorts the distance, but it's still incredibly significant uh, that we know that they're getting there, not just from Peter Ryan's sightings, but also the, the data loggers are consistently showing that uh, now as well. And that was, a, I haven't read the article I'm thinking of for quite some time, but uh, I think that was over two, possibly three years. Uh, that study so it wasn't just like a, a freak one one-off event and if you tie that in with what peter saw and then peter in 2008 also saw thousands of shearwaters which he now believes probably were short tailed so we're pretty certain well we're certain that they're going down there okay uh, i think that sums up uh, all the questions we have for tonight for you uh, or do, does martin have any more questions do you see no nope. nothing okay uh, well, thank you again, Bob, and I hope okay, uh, we would like uh, to see you maybe in the Netherlands on the Dutch Burning Day uh, one time. And then, then, uh, well, I feel a bit cheated because uh, uh, the time that I could do it is obviously now when we're locked down in the UK, so I missed the opportunity to come to the Netherlands. So I'm recording this and I will play it back to you for yeah. an invite next year. <laughs> nice. Okay, yes. we'll do that. Cool. Uh, I uh, think Martin has some more announcements and then uh, we'll finish off the uh, evening. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bob. You really okay. got me eager to check all my uh, uh, my photos of Sulu Shearwaters at Zouk, so uh, um, I know what I'm going to be doing tonight. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to switch to Dutch for a few, for a, for a minute. Um, share my screen. Oké, okay, uh, dank jullie wel allemaal weer voor het kijken. Uh, morgen hebben we nog de lezing van uh, Peter Knijf. Die begint om 8 uur over uh, bruinsluipers en kwikstaarten. Uh, daarna Mark Dijksterhuis over sonogramvogelen. En dan uh, natuurlijk vrijdag nog de Mystery Bird competitie. Waarbij een mooie verrekijker uh, te winnen is die beschikbaar wordt gesteld door uh, uh, vogelbescherming. En dan nogmaals, vergeet natuurlijk niet te stemmen op de DB Most Wanted. We hebben nu al twee dagen behoorlijke knallers uh, ook voor de WP uh, langs zien komen. Dus wie weet is dat nog wat inspiratie om op te stemmen. En uh, dan hopen jullie morgen te zien. Thanks. Yes. Goedenavond. Thank you. Good evening all. Okay.